and welcome to my series of short videos in which we discuss how the Arduino interacts with various electronic components. Yes, in less than 30 minutes we'll talk about how we can move your Arduino to a state machine. Hints, tips, tricks and traps. And welcome to the second part of moving your Arduino to a proper state machine. Now, you hopefully have watched the first part. There we are, look, up in the corner of the screen you'll see the first part link. Yeah, if you haven't watched it, you really should do as you won't make a lot of sense of this part. I'm just saying, you know, so watch that one first. It's only about 20 minutes and then come back to this one. I want to give a big shout out to PCB Way, PCB prototype, the easy way. Now, we're all familiar with their special PCBs, $5 for 10 pieces. But uh, you can also have FedEx PCBs, advanced PCBs, and of course, you can order custom parts. Let's have a look at the CNC and 3D printing options they have. So it's 3D printing first. You upload your CAD files as you would do normally for a PCB, but then you select your materials and submit a quote request. CNC machining is pretty similar in the way you submit your files, upload your CAD files, select one of these many, many different types of material you can use. And of course, there are also 27 different options for the surface finishing. Just look at a few of those there from anodized, brushed, bead blast, spray painting, and there's more under that list as well. And finally, there's sheet metal, laser cutting and bending. So let's have a look at that. Once again, you upload your CAD files, select the product you want to make it from, and uh, specify a few of the parameters here about whether you want threads, for example. And you can always submit your request for a quote, and it's about uh, seven to nine business days to get it done. Okay, that's PCB Way. Excellent service, good quality. Why don't you check them out now? Oh, you're still here. Okay, now last time we left the state machine as it was then in this multitasking situation here where we had a red and a green LED running independent functions and not interfering with each other. And that is important for the next stage where we actually use proper known and recorded states. Yes, now some of you mentioned that there's a switch on here with a yellow LED and that's what we're going to be using. So I'm going to disconnect the green and red lines for the minute because they're sort of a distraction. We'll just push those to one side and we'll concentrate on what the yellow LED does. So we've disconnected those two flashing LEDs so it doesn't distract us and we're going to concentrate on the yellow LED plus the switch and we're going to model a real world state machine on this Arduino. Now it's going to be slightly simplified, but it gets the point across. So what real world example can we use? Before we think about that, I think we need a tiny little bit of theory of about what a state machine is and why we need to know about it and the little drawings that you can do. It's useful when we come to actually program this, believe me. So what, what is a state machine then? It sounds great. Can I drop it into the conversation at the next party I go to, for example? Now, if you're going to drop these terms into the conversation at your next soiree or party, you need to get them right. So we say state machine, but what we actually mean is finite state machine. In other words, there are a limited number of states that the thing you're trying to model in your computer can be at, right? And that applies to anything. And, and really, you, me, the world, most things are in finite states. Although there may be a huge number of them, they are still limited to how many states they can be in. And they've got to be for the computer to cope, yeah? So, first of all, it's a finite state machine, FSM, as it shows you on the there for short. And the diagrams we're going to draw are state diagrams. Great, okay. Now, what does Wikipedia say about it? Wikipedia says, a state diagram is used in computer science, yeah, to describe the behaviour of systems. Oh dear. Hmm. It, it is a bit dry, isn't it? All right, that's fine. As a declaration of what it is, let's move on and just see what else it can tell us. State diagrams require that the system described is composed of a finite number of states. Well, we just said that, haven't we? Let's take the absolute simplest example of everyday things that could be in a finite state. Okay, are you prepared for this? A light bulb or a light here in my workshop. Yeah, it can either be off or on. And the starting point for that light, as shown by that squiggle with an arrow is always off. That's where we start from. That's what that bit indicates in our diagram. Okay, great. So my light 
here has got two states and it's not dimmable so it can't sort of dim in between it's either off or on two states you can't get simpler than that how do you get from one state to the other though there's something that happens some input some action required to move it from off to on and that action is we flick a switch yeah that's that's literally it so i flick my switch in the morning the light goes from off to on ta-da and then when i leave in the evening i flick the switch again would you believe yeah i know it's really difficult stuff this isn't it we flick the switch and it goes back to the off we're back to the starting state aren't we oh yes you can drop this in as well this little diagram is known as a directed graph yeah just a little bit of terminology for you does it help you write better code in your or you know that or esp that no, of course it doesn't of course it doesn't but if you were studying computer science you really would have to know this stuff but from our point of view as sort of hobbyists and low level coders this this sort of stuff is enough okay let's think of a better real world example shall we here we are now a traffic light everybody knows what a traffic light is and as you can see there there are only three states the traffic lights can be in red amber or green okay okay all those people in the uk will be going oh no it's not you can have red and amber together yeah no we're different okay in fact there are quite a lot of countries that do things differently would you believe with traffic lights but we're going to stick with well uh when i was in germany this is the way they did it when i was in the united states this is the way they did it so the starting point for the traffic light is red that's what that means remember that circle with an arrow we start at red and you're waiting at the traffic light and after a few seconds let's say 15 it goes to green state great all the cars start moving and after 30 seconds it goes to an amber state and then pretty shortly after that five seconds it goes back to red and that's that's it that is another state machine that we we know from everyday life there's nothing complicated but that is the diagram now the example we're going to be using in our arduino then is what happens if you're standing in the lobby of a, an hotel and uh, you want to call the elevator yeah lift yeah elevator same thing let's have a look how the state machine for that might look and more particularly the state diagram first of all the starting point is it's idle nothing is happening no parts are moving because nobody's there yet let's assume it's 2 a.m in the morning nothing's moving everything is idle waiting yeah okay the next state is that a lift has been called then the lift arrives at the floor where so you can get onto it great the doors open fantastic you get in doors shut and off it goes yeah but this is simplified remember so how do you move from one state to the other in this particular example well to get from idle to called we have to physically push a button yeah great after that though there's some sort of delay isn't there between after it being called and when it arrives you don't know how long that's going to be it could be instant because the lift unknown to you is actually waiting behind that closed door so as you push the button it's like there to i don't know a minute later you're still waiting what happens then of course everybody pushes that button 20 times quickly in some bizarre hope that it's going to change the state machine or state diagram that we've got here it makes no difference once it's called it's called it knows what it's doing okay so the doors um are still shut well even though it's arrived so the next state must be the little tiny delay as it settles and make sure it's all safe doors open great and I think that's about it. We're done then. Once the doors are open, it goes back into the idle state. Simple? Yeah, okay. Oversimplified, maybe. But we're just proving the point here in Arduino speak, how we're going to get that diagram into code into your Arduino and working, at least as well as what I'm going to show you on the board now. Let's, let's see if we can do that. It's quick, easy, and you will have a state machine after this. Right, let's see how the diagram there matches up to what's been coded on this Arduino. First of all, it's idle. Nothing's happening. Yeah, no lights are lit. Nothing. We're just waiting. So the first thing I'm going to do is push that button, which, of course, is this action here. Push the button. It's now been called. There's a random delay until it arrives. And we wait and we wait and we wait. Oh, there it is. So it's arrived. That little bleep tells us it arrived and the doors opened yeah all very simplistic but it will show you the 
the four different states in our code. Right, talking of code, time to move over to the Arduino IDE. Okay, I lied, it's not the Arduino IDE. This is in fact a different IDE, Platform IO, Visual Studio Code basically. Um, but this will work just the same, of course, in the Arduino IDE. Okay. Now I've also got on there, the uh, above my head here, the serial monitor output from this program. Let's have a look at that first, because I think the code might make more sense if we do it that way. And bearing in mind what we just saw for the state diagram, what we can see here is that, okay, once the setup's been done, everything's in the idle state. Yeah, then I had to push the button. So the elevator was called and it says, oh, look, there's a five second delay. It's a delay I've just built into the sketch to emulate what happens in real life. Yeah, if only the, the elevator did come within five seconds. Yeah, I know. So at that point, it moves from idle state to called state. Yes. And after five seconds, it moves to arrive state, then doors open state and then idle state again. I know there's just you think hang on surely there's got to be more to the no there's not more to it there is more in the code of course but that is basically what we're looking at okay let's have a look at the code now as i said you must have watched the previous video i did on multitasking which is the first step towards having a proper state machine and indeed there was some state machineness of that previous code even though it wasn't explicit there was implicit state machine though so but this time it's going to be very explicit okay but you should watch it there it is up in that corner there okay right you're still here let's have a look at the code this time around now the code is just an enhancement on the code that we did last time yeah? especially in the first few steps here so what we've done is defined a couple of extra pins for the push button and the beeper just to give us a bit of audible feedback as you do get with a lift of course as the lift arrives, you tend to get a bing or something so that you know which one has arrived. Otherwise, you stand there blindly looking at a lift, don't you? And the doors haven't opened because it's the one behind you. Yeah, I know. OK, now we've got another yellow LED. Yeah, fine. And there's a couple of little um, functions here that are extra to last time. One, we've got the yellow LED function that puts the yellow LED on or off. And the display state is what you just saw in that debugging window the serial monitor output all it does is display that string to keep it out of the main bit of code so the setup has been modified to count to account for that yellow led but apart from that nothing else so we can just basically shut that one up okay now last time we had a blink red led and a blink green led and they worked independently by the virtue of the fact we had this static unsigned long integer here and this bit of code only ran every so often but mostly it was doing nothing and going straight back to the loop and that's how we got our multitasking function working rather nicely and implicit in this of course we didn't actually state it but the very fact that the millis was the driving factor and the state of the led as it was is also a bit of a state machiney thing to do but not explicitly so let's just close this down and move on to the real state machine Right, so toggle yellow LED. If we look in the loop, we see we're going to do three things, yeah? Do the red LED, do the green LED, and now we're going to do the yellow LED. But the yellow LED is not just a simple flash on and off. It's a little bit more sophisticated than that. So let's have a look. Right, once again, though, we do have this unsigned static long here because we are, after all, turning it on and then off, and we're not having any delays in here. This has all got to be continuously flowing code, yes? No halts, no no bits of code that say stop everything don't do anything just wait no blocking code at all now the elevator delay we don't know what that is i've just emulated that and said go and get me a random number as to how long the elevator is going to be and anything between i think it's three and seven or something like that but here we come to the first thing in your state machine of interest in our state diagram We've already discovered what the states are, so there's no thinking about, oh, what are we going to call this? No, we know what they're going to be called because we drew them out in that state diagram. Idle, called, arrived, doors open. The exact names are not important, but it's what the state is, describing the state as best you want to do it, yes? Now, if you don't like the word idle, you just want it to be called waiting or something, fine. It's not going to change the logic of the code. It's whatever works best for you. So we've got this enum. If you're not familiar with enums, they are <clears throat> constructs that allow a particular variable to have a particular value as defined in here. Now, as you can see, if 
a value of another variable had a value of idle, it would be zero. If it was called, it would be one. Arrived is two, and doors open three. You can change that, but I'm not going to get into that because it's not relevant to what we're trying to do here. I haven't just said enum integer name. No, I've said class. Why have I used a class? Well, here I've said it's for type safety and code readability. Yes, that's true, but what do I mean by that? Well, if you declare an integer of this type now, it can only have one of these four states. It, the compiler will not let you set it to another state. If by some fluke in your program you wanted to set that to five, the compiler would go, you can't do it. What do you mean? What do you mean five? Five is not relevant. I've only got between zero and three here, so choose one of those. That's why we're using a class. You'll see the construct in a minute. Here is our elevator state. This is the thing that determines what's happening in our program. And as you can see, it's a static elevator state, the thing we've defined here. Yeah, so this is what the type is. We're calling it cur state. You can call it elevator state or lift state or whatever. And the first state that it's set to is elevator state. That's the name here. Colon, colon, idle. Now, this is where the class thing comes into its own. It's forcing you to use this kind of construct. You must say the name of the class, elevator state, colon, colon, and then one of these four names here. You can't say current state equals eight. It just The compiler goes, what's that then? That's not what you've told me that particular class can contain. So it's type safe and it's readable. If you look at that line, elevator state, current state, is equal to elevator state idle. I mean, it's self-descriptive, isn't it? Very important when we get into code like this. Now, all state machines that I've ever seen either have some kind variant of a switch statement, which you might not have used before, of course. A switch statement, uh, in days of yore, we had go to depending on. Oh, God, that brings back bad memories. Yes, I know. Basically, what it means is we have the current state at a particular value, and therefore we're going to jump to a particular piece of code depending on what that value is. Let's have a look in more detail. So what it's doing then is saying, OK, let's look at the current value of curse state. And if it's this state, do something. But if it's another state, we'll do something else. But look at the way this is written. Because we're using that class enum, we're saying, well, if it's elevator state, colon, colon, idle. We don't have to say if it's 1 or 8 or 22 or something else, which are all magic numbers and mean nothing to anybody. But elevator state idle most definitely means something to you, me, and the compiler. And it's self-descriptive. It, it's commenting and describing itself as we write it. So great. We're saying, OK, well, if that current state is idle, elevator status idle, we're going to do this bit of code. And then right down the bottom, you'll see where it says break. You must always have a break at the very last sentence of a case statement. Otherwise, what happens? Well, one, the compiler normally complains and say, Oi, you're going to drop through to the next case statement. Yeah, you don't want that. We're saying, no, we're going to do this bit of code only if the elevator state is idle. We're in the idle state now, sure. Everything's dead. Yeah, it's two o'clock in the morning. Nothing's moving. No lift has been called anywhere. It's just sitting there, idle. So the, what we're looking at here is, well, has somebody pressed that push button to call the lift? If it's not, this if statement goes all the way down to the bottom, break, end of statement, end of switch statement, go back to the loop and try again. So it's in and out. Very important, remember, to keep our whole process running fluidly. Eventually, of course, somebody does press that button. When they press that button, we go, right, let's, let's capture the millis as it is now, which you should, of course, remember from the last video we did on this, so that we know how long it's been in the rest of the code uh, since we captured that. And then, of course, having pressed the button, the elevator turns up after a random interval of time, isn't it? Which is why I've put this bit here in braces, because it's not really part of our state machine code, but I had to get the delay somewhere. So what I've said is just create a random delay between three and seven seconds inclusive, and uh, put that into a variable called elevator delay, that one there. Yeah, cool. But that's not really part of the state machine. It's just how we're going to emulate this delay. And then we say, well, having pushed that button and got the delay, 
the state has changed now. We're not idle anymore. No, no. The current state now is elevator state called, which means we shouldn't be in this bit of code anymore. So we're breaking back to the loop. Yeah, it doesn't try other states now. It just exits immediately. But the state now is that we're in a called state. OK, so it's gone back to the loop. The loop has called the red and green LED to flash. And now it's back in here. The switch statement says, right, what's the current state? And it's called. So it skips the first case statement because that was not valid. And it comes to this one here and says, right, the case elevator state called is true. So this is the bit of code now I want to do. So we're going to display call state to our debugging monitor. We're then going to turn the light on, the one that's normally on part of the push button, to say, yep, yeah, you've called the lift. Great. And then we need a certain delay, don't we? We go, well, if the delay now is greater than the elevator delay, do something else. But of course, half the time, it's not going to be, is it? So we skip this, break, go back to the loop. So basically, we're still in this called state. The state hasn't changed, but we're waiting. We're waiting for this statement here to become true. Has the delay for the lift that time, has it passed? Well, eventually, it says yes. There's been four seconds delay, and that now is true. The elevator delay was four seconds, and four seconds has passed. So what do we do? Well, we move it to the next state, because that's the only thing that was preventing it moving, the delay. The delay has happened, so now we say the elevator state is now arrived. Break out, back to the loop. So the loop, once again, goes through its little routines of flashing the red LED, flashing the green LED, back into this routine, looking at the switch statement and going, right, what's the current state? And it is arrived, so this is the bit of code we do. So it says arrived, we display that arrive state on the debugging monitor. We then say beep to alert the user that the elevator has arrived. Um, we then set another timer here to say, how long are we going to beep that for? How long does the beep happen? We can't do a delay. We can't say start the beeper going and then just wait for half a second, quarter of a second, one second, whatever it is. We can't sit here and wait. That's, that's a no-no. There's no delays here, no blocking code. So having started the beeper beeping at this point here, we take a snapshot of the millis again into beep millis and say, great, the next date, doors are opening now. The, the bell started to bing, so it's just gone bing. The doors are going to open, so we set the state to doors open. Break, which means we exit all this, back to the loop. Red and green LEDs flash, back into this bit of code for the yellow one. What's the current state? Well, doors are open. What do we do now? Right, so doors are open. What has happened? Well, we display the fact that doors are open on the debugging monitor. We extinguish the LED straight away because that's been on now for X seconds, hasn't it? And we go, well, is it time to turn the beeper off yet? And we look at this statement here and go, well, has it been 100 milliseconds since that beeper started beeping? And if it's not, well, we just continue through, break, go back to the loop. Yeah, I know. So eventually it comes into here. And having come into this doors open state again and again and again and again, after 100 milliseconds time of having come in here, this statement will eventually be true. And it goes, oh, right, yes, I've been, that's been beeping for 100 milliseconds, one tenth of a second. Great. Let's turn it off. And now we're setting the elevator state back to idle. All right. I know that the doors are now effectively open. That wasn't quite the state it was when we first started. I should have said doors closed and off it goes before we go back to idle. But I'm guessing the boredom factor could easily creep in here. So we're just going to mull over that a little bit and say, fine. At that point, we're going back to the idle state because nobody's pressed anything. Yeah. So back to idle, which means, of course, the, the next time it comes into this routine, it's going to go right to the very top and go, has anybody pushed the button to call me yet? Easy. Now, the switch statement is a bit funny because right at the bottom it goes default. So you've checked for various cases effectively checking for is the current state equal to 0, 1, 2, or 3. And if it's not any of those, it must be something else. So default. And it says here, well, we're going to print something out to the debug monitor to go and the default switch case has reached. It's an error. Well, not only is it an error, it means you compile it, didn't compile the code correctly. So 
the chances of that happening are slim to none. Yeah, let's face it. You can't get this, the current state of the elevator anything other than 0, 1, 2 or 3 because that's what we've defined. Idle, called, waiting, doors open. That's all you've got. So if any this ever comes up, well, your, your Arduino or whatever processor you're using has probably been hit by some cosmic ray and jumped into something else or there's been some weirdness going on because this can never, ever, ever be true. But you have to put it in. The compiler will insist that you put a default statement at the bottom. And let's face it, it's good practice to do it anyway. Um, certainly, if you were going to test this, you'd try and test it to make this happen. But you won't be able to. Fine. OK. Is that it then? What? You were expecting more, were you? Hmm. So if you think you've followed this and seen that diagram there and you go, yeah, I've got the idea that there's four states for this particular elevator or whatever it is you're trying to control. And we've moved from one state to another by some action or, you know, it could be a delay that is still an action or somebody actually pressing a button or something happening. That's great. I mean, let's just press it again. Make sure this is all still working. Press the button. It's called. Cool, the light's on. Eventually the light will go off and we should get a beep. There we are. Beep light off back to idle state it, it happens so quickly in real life doesn't it in computer programs but that's exactly what it's doing this this thing up here now i said that the loop is calling the red and green flashy thing as well as all this okay let me put those wires back and uh, we'll see how well it's it's worked yeah so there we are the red and green leds are still flashing at their own independent rates and does this all still work? Let's have a look. Press the button. We're waiting for the lift to arrive. Eventually the lift does arrive and the light goes out. The beep happens. Everything happens all simultaneously, which we know is, of course, not the case, but it's close enough for us humans to say, yeah, it's all happening at the same time. So, And although everything I've shown you on here is all part of one big state machine, the bit that we're really concentrating on this one is the calling of the elevator and the yellow LED. That's the bit where we explicitly state this is a state machine. Cool, yeah? Now, if you can do it in one, if you can do this up here for a simple little elevator that doesn't actually exist, you could do it for any number of things, whether it's um, you know, a, a web radio or a smart heater controller or anything else. Once you've got the diagram in your head, and it, well, ideally not in your head, written down so you understand the states that you can go to. That is how you get to a state machine. And your code can only emulate what you've got written up there. If you if you end up writing stuff that isn't part of that diagram, you go, hang on a minute, what's, what's going on there? Why am I breaking the diagram and adding extra bits in? Is it because I didn't cater for a particular state up here or perhaps a particular action between one state and another? That's the thing to avoid. It's the diagram that really tells you whether you're doing it right. And the code simply implements that. Don't start adding stuff into the code that doesn't exist in the diagram, because otherwise the two will never match and you'll wonder what's going on. As an introduction to moving to a state machine, I think this is OK. Yeah, I mean, you can take the code. All the code will be in my GitHub and download that and see if you can follow it through. I made it as simple as I can, but no simpler. I know, yes, I do follow the the words of Albert Einstein, yes. Um, and I think we're done, really. If you've got any comments and queries, do put them down there. Comments are good. Comments are good, as are likes. Apparently, YouTube like likes, and it likes comments. So, great. I'd be happy if you did both or either of those. And, uh, yeah, we'll see where we go next in our coding adventures on the Arduino. See you in the next video. I hope you're finding these videos useful and interesting. There are plenty more videos to choose and a couple are shown below. And if you'd like to subscribe to this channel, just click on my picture below and enjoy the rest of the videos. Thanks for watching.